Hello and welcome. We are going to be talking about module S, which is psychological effects of aging. We're going to describe the psychological effects that come along with the aging process, explain our role as nurse aides in meeting the basic needs of our resident, describe our role in caring for residents with a variety of responses, such as um, in some of these we've talked about a little bit already, right? Depressed residents, combative residents, and agitated residents and describe the feelings and behaviors of the older adult as they move into the nursing home. So the psychological effects of aging. This is a, an exploration of feelings, emotional stress, physical, psychological, um, physiological adjustments that are all part of the aging process. Um, to function successfully, nurse aides should be aware of basic human behavior and needs and how these behaviors and needs change as we age. And this goes back to, you guys have seen this pyramid before, it looked, it looked a little different in previous slides, but it is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, making sure that we need to meet physiological needs first before we can think about meeting the safety needs. Um, before we can meet belonging and belonging in love, we have to meet those safety needs, et cetera. So physical needs, so this is right at the bottom, those physiological needs, oxygen, food, water, shelter, sleep, elimination, and activity. These are all physical needs. Just some examples, as nurse aides, how are we making sure our residents are getting their need for oxygen? elevating the head of bed, sitting them up in the chair, assisting with any breathing exercises like an incentive spirometer or coughing and deep breathing, reporting cyanosis or that blue color around the lips. Food, we're assisting those who need help. Make sure dentures are in place, serving food at the proper temperature in a pleasant environment in the appropriate amounts and water. Sure that our residents, unless there's some sort of restriction, always have fresh drinking water within reach and provided at intervals throughout the day. Shelter. We need to provide warmth to dress our residents or help them to dress properly for the temperature. Sleep. We need to assist by minimizing noise and light during sleep hours. We could be providing back rubs to help relax, report complaints of any pain to the nurse, listen to concerns or worries, and if a resident requests a light, night light to be on, make sure that we do that if we can. Elimination and activity. So elimination, we're helping our residents to meet their toileting needs as necessary, right? Whether that be going to the bathroom, the bedside commode, or using a bedpan or urinal. Provide for privacy. Change soiled linens immediately. And if our resident is on a bowel or bladder training program, follow that exactly. Activity, this is performing like range of motion exercises, turning and repositioning at least every two hours or more often as needed, assisting with activity as directed, encouraging movement, and encouraging um, participation in recreational activities that may interest our residents. Next level up on Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs is the safety and security. Um, we want to establish familiar surroundings for our residents. So when we get, especially when we get a resident new to the nursing home, we want to explain um, the layout of the nursing home. We want to explain procedures, routines, schedules, talk to them about their room. Um, for safety and security, provide them a safe environment, promote the use of their personal belongings, and keep promises. So if you tell a resident you're going to do something or be somewhere at a certain time, stick with that promise. Maintain order and follow routines that can really help people to feel safe and secure. It's to reduce fear and anxiety by checking on the resident frequently, frequently and avoid rushing and assist the resident in a gentle manner. Next on the, on the hierarchy of needs is our love and affection. This can be met in a variety of ways. Friendship, um, feeling socially accepted in your environment, in that sense of closeness. And this can be with other residents, um, it could be with staff members, it could be with family members. Um, love and affection is meaningful relationships with others, um, but it can also be love and sexuality. Mm -hmm. 
belonging. Um, this is the need. This need is often met by family or family support members. Friends can also meet this need. And like I was saying a second ago, the nursing staff can become family. So it's it's important if we have the time to sit and visit for a few minutes when it allows. Display warmth. You can gentle touch. Show acceptance of the resident for their unique qualities and their individuality. Promote, a care, promote care in a kind, friendly, and considerate manner. So self-esteem and self-actualization. So self-esteem is the value and worth and opinion of ourself. It's seeing ourselves as useful and being well thought of by others. We can facilitate this by calling the resident by the name he or she prefers. Discuss current issues, request their opinion on different things, show respect and approval, assist them to dress and groom how they want, how it makes them feel good, encourage independence and socialization, share goals. So what is self-actualization? This is realizing your personal potential, including creative activities, it's self-fulfillment, it's seeking personal growth and peak experiences. It's a desire to become everything that one is capable of becoming. This is why self-actualization is that very tippy top of the pyramid. Um, and something to keep in mind, and I may have said this in a previous lecture, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we go up and down that pyramid throughout our lives. Our end goal is to end with that self-actualization. Some people may never get there, um, but if they do, and if we can facilitate that, that's wonderful. So self-actualization can be difficult for the older adult due to unmet physical needs, um, unmet security needs, unmet love and affection needs, and unmet needs for self-esteem. You can't get to that self-actualization um, if you don't meet those other needs, right? So physical needs, they might have mobility challenges or pain. Security, they might lack privacy or be scared in their environment. Love and infection. Um, they might feel isolated or they might be isolating themselves or have no family or family support. Self-esteem, they might feel negative about themselves or lack confidence. So we can encourage self-actualization by encouraging our residents to meet new people. We want to assist residents to attend presentations or activities such as guest speakers or musical performances in the facility or sometimes if they do field trips, go on a field trip. Discuss plans for trying something new. Um, when a resident is successful at something new, offer some praise and encouragement. It's important to encourage somebody's creative side, whether that be music or art or poetry. We can offer audio books, um, audio, oh, I said audio books, music playlists. Spending time with a resident to discover what activities are meaningful to them is what's going to be most important. You can ask what matters to you, what matters to you today. And then kind of go from there. If you can help them to do things that are important to them or find creative outlets that are meaningful to them, that's going to help our residents to get to that self-actualization. And there's that another version of the hierarchy of needs. So we have spiritual needs as well. So residents have a right to worship and express their faith freely. We need to respect residents' beliefs and religious objects. If there are any religious um, services that are available, we want to make sure our resident is aware of them and we help them get to them if they want to. And provide visit, uh, privacy if members of their, um, like the, for example, the members of the clergy come. Sexuality is expressed by individuals of all ages, so sexual needs and desires continue throughout life. This can be expressed in a variety of ways, such as sexual intercourse, caressing, touching, holding hands, or masturbation. Some ways to show feminine or masculine qualities is through your resident's choice in clothing or hairstyle, um, their hobbies, their habits, their gestures. Illness, disability, or obviously living environment can affect the needs and desires of our residents. We can assist to maintain, um, assist our residents 
maintain their sexual identity by dressing them, letting them choose their clothing, dressing them up, like if they want to have a, a nice dinner, um, helping them prepare for special activities, um, doing makeup or hair or nails. So help to develop a positive self-image. We always want to respect our residents' sexual orientation and gender identity. Use transgender residents' chosen name and pronouns, such as he or she, and their, or whatever their pronoun of choice is. We want to encourage residents to talk about their family members of choice and avoid assuming that all residents are either heterosexual, heterosexual or straight, because that's going to deprive our residents of dignity and respect that everyone deserves. We want to show acceptance and understanding for how a resident chooses to express love or sexuality. So provide privacy, um, always knock before entering a resident's room. And when, especially when pri privacy is specifically requested, be sure to honor that. So you could do like a do not disturb sign, for example. Refrain from gossiping about um, a resident's relationships or sexuality. Avoid viewing expressions of sexuality as disgusting or cute. Because again, this is something that would deprive your resident of the dignity and respect that they deserve. We do have to provide protection for unconsenting residents though. So be firm, but gentle. If a resident advance, does sexual advances towards you as a healthcare worker. So we're going to switch gears here to developmental tasks of aging. So there are certain skills that must be mastered during a stage of development. There are different stages throughout life, but we're going to focus on the late adulthood tasks. And these include adjustment to retirement, reduced income, death of friends and spouses, physical changes, and loss of independence. Late adulthood tasks also include, therefore, creating new friendships and relationships, loss of vitality, integrating of all of our life experiences, and preparation for death. Some issues involving care of the elderly that may arise. The amount of care needed. So as we age, we don't know, are, are we gonna need a lot of care? Are we gonna be fairly dependent on somebody? Are we gonna be able to take care of ourselves? The cost of that care, our nutritional needs, relationships with our family and support system, the location of our family and support system, other medical care needs. The elderly person may experience changes in lifestyle. So for example, if they move from a home to a nursing care uh, facility, they're now living with a group of people with less independence, a structured lifestyle, less privacy, and it may be difficult to adapt to those changes. The decision made by the individual or family for a long to go into long-term care can cause a lot of stress. If you think about it, you know, the older adult often views their home as their castle, for example. It's a place that they've often lived in for 20 plus years. To an older adult, their home may represent, let me get caught up on my, there we go. Um, it may represent their independence, a link to the past. Their home may have become a part of their identity, identity a center of family gatherings, a connection to the neighborhood. It may even be a symbol of their position in the community. And of course, a place to maintain autonomy and control. When the older adult relocates from the home, it could be due to a variety of things. And often it's a combination, decrease in finances, decline in physical or mental state, resulting in the need for more assistance, the inability to manage the home, lack of social support, or increasingly unsafe neighborhood. An older adult's um, reaction to relocation from the home depends on a variety of things as well. The degree of choice that they had, the degree of preparation, the degree of sameness from the old location to the new location, the degree of predictability, the number of additional losses that occurred in the older adult's life. Did they also lose a loved one, lose their health, lose their finances, um, lose their roles in their family. Admission to a nursing home, about one third of men and over half of women who turn 65 are expected to live in a nursing home before they die. The older adult may fear life in the nursing home more than his or her own death. 
Older adults often view admission to a nursing home as a series of losses and being forced into unpredictable surroundings in which they own, their only certainty is further loss. Admission is often involuntary and traumatic for the older adult and initiated by a family member. Take a second to take all that in and put yourself in someone else's shoes. So how do you feel when you are suddenly admitted to a nursing home? You typically will experience a great deal of stress. You'll have a sense of loss, fear, isolation, confusion, and being out of control. On the other hand, sometimes people feel a sense of relief. They don't have to care for their home. They don't have to cook for themselves. They don't have to clean. They don't have to go shopping anymore. Either way, the event is often viewed as the ending of one phase of the older adult's life and the beginning of the final phase. Now let's talk about community. So the nursing home may be perceived as an accidental community of sorts, where people with different interests, tastes, cultural backgrounds, social classes, educational backgrounds, occupations, etc., live together in a blended living arrangement in an institutional setting with dozens or even hundreds of people. Residents in the nursing home um, represent a really wide range of ages, so we tend to think of the older adult, but we can have younger adults in nursing homes as well. People in the nursing home may stay for a short time or a long time. They have a variety of diagnoses and they vary in their degree of functional impairment and disability. They also will vary in their level of cognition. About 75% of residents in the nursing homes are female. In the nursing home, you've got fixed routines and schedules, um, meal times, medications, wait times and bedtimes. The older adult's life is built on previously established social roles and personal routines. So those routines, those personal routines and schedules that we had may collide with the institutional schedules causing conflict. So for example, um, Mr. Smith has um, always been the king of his household, right? Now he's being told what to do. Um, or Miss, Miss Jones always has her coffee and morning paper before she goes to eat breakfast. And now she's told she has to go eat her breakfast first thing in the morning before she can have her paper and coffee. Life in the nursing home is also very limited in space. Personal space is limited and reduced to a few square feet around the bed and storage is limited. The resident may, have, may live in a shared bedroom with no choice of roommate and no control over who stays in the other bed. It could be someone who is dying. It could be someone who is confused. And it, oftentimes it's a series of roommates. The resident may feel violated if a confused resident invades their personal space or messes with or takes their personal items. At home, of course, this was very different. An older adult could lock the door and choose whether or not to answer. They may also choose whether or not to let someone come in. At the nursing home, you can't lock the door and a knock on the door signifies more than anything, a knock on coming in. And like we mentioned, cognitively impaired residents are housed with the cognitively intact. Cognitively intact and cognitively impaired residents share the same dining hall in most nursing homes. And it may be a shock to the cognitively intact to see residents drooling or spitting or screaming out. Programs and activities in the nursing home are often the same for all residents. And they're also very, usually very simple and basic because they have to meet the needs of everyone. Residents may be frightened if they hear erratic screams, screams, moans, or repetitive sounds from other residents. The cognitively intact older adult tends to adapt to life in the nursing home in one of three ways. Become depressed, they may regress, withdraw from others, and only show interest in events and that affect their own personal, physical self. That's one way. Number two, they may become narrow-minded, uncooperative with staff, and fight all attempts to be included into the normal, standard routine of the nursing home. They refuse to view the nursing home as their home. And the third way, 
They're determined to make the best of their stay in the nursing home, and sometimes they'll even claim to prefer it to the life before admission. It's important to realize that a normal response to sudden placement in a nursing home, such as depression, withdrawal, or moodiness, is often viewed as poor adjustment to life in the nursing home. But it's not. This is a normal process when we first enter the nursing home. So nursing home staff may unfairly and prematurely label the resident as difficult if they don't take this into consideration. As the nurse aide, we have a role in adjusting to life in the nursing home. We can decrease residents' doubts and fears of the unknown and increase their feelings of control by providing all newly admitted residents with orientation to the facility. Find out how they want to be addressed, for example, Mr. or Mrs. Doctor um, and their preferred name, and use it with all subsequent introductions and communication with the resident. Provide each resident with a map of the facility, give them a personalized tour, um, and introduce them to other staff and other residents. We wanna make sure we provide initial explanation of routines and procedures, and always, always explain what is being done, why it's being done, and where the resident is being taken. We wanna learn about the resident's previous lifestyle, environment, and routines as much as we possibly can, and add that to the nursing care plan, because anytime we have the opportunity to kind of match up with what their life was like prior to being in the nursing home, let's do that for them. Older adults, when they come to the nursing home, have to part with a lot of important objects. Um, we should encourage, so they're often, what they do bring is, is probably the most valuable and special things to them, right? We want to encourage as much personalization of the space as possible. Um, and that could be, depending on the room, it could be furniture, it could be pictures, um, artwork, et cetera. We want to let the resident have plenty of time to decide on placement of their items. Um, and knowing that this could actually keep the resident's attention for a couple of weeks as they're adjusting. Only after the resident has organized their living space can they really direct their energies to like meeting new people um, and going to new places in the facility. So be aware that, that can take some time and allow it to happen. Lack of privacy and personal space can increase the stress and anxiety for residents. And this can be displayed in the form of illness, aggression, anger, submissiveness, and withdrawal. So when residents' privacy, personal space, and personal belongings are respected, um, they can better relate to others, they feel more secure, and it helps to maintain their identity of who they are. It's also important to remember that each resident needs downtime and time to relax and time to get away, right? So now they have a roommate, most likely. But we can facilitate this downtime um, by always knocking on their room, approaching them slowly, um, maintaining some space, when possible, ask, always ask permission before touching, um, whether it be touching the resident, their belongings, their clothes. Never read a resident's mail unless they ask you to do so. And keep their belongings safe. Um, don't pick it up and examine it and move it around. Ask permission first if you want to look at something more closely. We also want to be aware of our resident's reason for admission. You know, was it because of declining health or was it a death of a spouse? and understand that those stressors are going to directly influence and have a role in that new resident's behavior and reactions to the nursing home. And keep in mind, it is difficult to change lifelong habits, lifelong schedules, and lifelong rituals. Realize major changes that the resident is expected to handle in a short period of time and empathize with them. Recognize losses. Um, they lost their home and familiar surroundings, their belongings, former neighbors, their routine, their lifestyle, possibly a loved one, and their health. Recognize adjustments. Now they're living in a confined living space with others, sharing a bedroom with a stranger. There's new routines, new services, new facility, and they're being, every move is being watched. Encourage the resident to have as much control as possible. Encourage them to participate in planning their daily schedule and encourage them to set their own pace and to prioritize their daily activities. But we do want to encourage them to participate in facility activities, letting them know that it's when they're ready to do so. So OBRA, you guys remember OBRA. 
Um, so OBRA sent out a state surveyor who comes to check out nursing homes um, and see if they're up to, oh, I don't know why that slide's not going through. Um, comes to see that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So if you recall, um, OBRA was major legis legislation that was passed to protect residents in nursing homes and to ensure, assure, excuse me, that they would receive quality care and have a quality of life. The law requires states to have a survey and certification process in place, whereby each nursing home is surveyed annually to determine compliance with federal regulations. The survey is unannounced, performed annually, and it reviews quality of care as indicated by the evaluation of criteria, certain criteria, including medical, nursing, and rehabilitative care, dietary services, infection control, pharmacy services, physical environment, incidences of abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and resident-centered care planning. There are a variety of methods that are used during the survey. Obviously, they're going to be observing and looking all around them. They're going to do resident and family interviews, staff interviews, and they're going to evaluate the environment for safety and cleanliness and review records. Based on the findings of the state surveys, the nursing home can get a clean bill of health and be found to be in compliance, or they may be subject to fines, denial of federal fund, or at an extreme closed down. So it's important to remember that because of this, we need to make sure we're doing our job. And if something is not being done correctly, we need to bring it to the attention of somebody who can help. Um, because ultimately, if federal funds are withdrawn, that's going to affect our residents. They may have to move to a different facility and they have just come to a brand new facility. Maybe they were just starting to adjust. So really what we do in the nursing home when we're following policy and protocol, when we're being up to compliance, this is for the benefit of our residents. The regulation of nursing homes focuses on quality of life for the residents and emphasizes their individual rights. Because of OBRA, nursing home residents are more empowered and have a greater say in their own quality of life. All right, so we're gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about um, coming into, um, not contact with, that's not the right word, but interacting with um, some residents who may have some developmental disabilities, who are stressed, depressed, or agitated, and we're gonna talk about some strategies there. So caring for the resident who is depressed. Recognize there are different reasons, obviously, for depression. A loss of independence, death of a spouse or friend, loss of job or home, decreased memory or terminal illness. There are common signs and symptoms of depression that if you notice, you wanna make sure that you're addressing and bringing up to your nurse. Changes in sleep patterns, loss of appetite and weight loss, crying, withdrawal from activities, and appearing sad. When a resident is depressed, we can just, be sure to listen to their feelings, encourage them to reminisce, and involve them in activities. We want to also try and encourage family and friends to visit, avoid pitying the resident, help to focus on reality, promote self-esteem, and report any changes in eating, elimination, or sleeping patterns, and of course report those to your supervisor. Recognize that there are defense mechanisms. When someone's depressed, um, they may have some certain defense mechanisms that are behaviors that are not necessarily they're even aware they're doing. So it's unconscious behaviors that they may display. We're going to talk about a few of these. So projection. This is blaming others. Rationalization. This is a false reason for a situation. Denial. Pretending a problem does not exist. Compensation. Making up for a situation in some other way. Displacement. That's transferring the feelings about the one, per, one person to another. Daydreaming, escape from reality. Identification, oh, let me switch over, sorry about that. Identification is idolizing another and trying to copy him or her. And sublimation is redirecting feelings to a constructive activity. All right, let's talk about residents with developmental disabilities. So these diagnoses may include mental retardation, cerebral palsy, for example. Treat the individual with respect and dignity 
Encourage residents to make personal choices and do as much as possible for themselves as they can. We do want to use age appropriate personal skills, achieve their potential, interact with others, and don't act as the resident's parent. This is going to create dependency. Um, don't label the, the resident in a certain way. Um, we do want to build their self esteem and provide privacy as needed. Residents who are stressed, listening to their concerns, observing and reporting for nonverbal messages. Um, attempt to understand the behavior. Why are they stressed? Why are they behaving a certain way? Always be honest and trustworthy. Treat with dignity and respect. Don't argue and support their efforts to deal with this stress. Working with residents who are demanding. So attempt to discover the factors that are responsible for their behavior. Display a caring attitude. Listen to verbal and nonverbal messages. What's going to be really, really important with demanding residents is that you give consistent care and you spend some time with the resident and you keep your word. If you promise, say you're going to come back at a specific time, keep that promise. For demanding residents, those last three are going to be super important. All right, so agitated residents. Encourage them to talk about their fears. Remind the resident of their past ability to cope with change. Encourage them to ask questions, um, voice their concerns, involve them in activities that promote self-esteem. Um, we can assign them some ta small tasks, use reality orientation, and observe for safety and prevent wandering. Caring for the residents who are paranoid. Reassure the residents that you will provide safety. That's probably the biggest one for these folks. Realize that their behavior is based in fear situations. Avoid agreeing or disagreeing with comments, provide a common environment, and involve in reality activities. Caring for residents who are combative. Display a calm manner. Don't touch the resident. Provide privacy. Get help if needed. Do not ignore any threats that they make. And protect yourself and others from harm. Also, make sure that we listen without aggression, argument, or taking what they're saying um, personally.